So I didn't have time to lay out my notes as cleanly as I usually do, but I will use this skeleton and add a few more things to let you understand Drive, the film of this week from 2011, from a different perspective. I will start from a new discussion about the genre of the film. I will focus your attention on the significance of the silver jacket with the scorpion worn by the driver. And then we will talk about one way we can read the film based on the theme, the song, Real Human Being and a Real Hero, how we can read this film differently, but in a way that may not be the only way, but once you see it, it becomes almost elementary. Okay, so as you find in the notes for this film, this film technically is a noir or a neo-noir. And I will not go back to the features of that genre. Can it be defined also as a road movie? Well, this classification is a bit unconventional, I have to admit. However, for one thing, I didn't want to be boring and, and include in the class just traditional, conventional road movies. And you'll see another example of a less conventional road movie at the end of the class with Drive My Car. On the other hand, there are elements that place this film within the genre of the road movie. The fact that you find the protagonist at the beginning of the film when he's about to leave his apartment in Los Angeles. And in fact, you find in the establishing shots, the shots that give you a glance at the premise of the story, prominently displayed, you find a large green suitcase. And at the end of the first sequence, you find this character entering a new apartment. However, it is quite clear that neither the first apartment at the beginning of the film, nor the second one in the same building where Irene, Benicio, and Standard live are home to him. So it's someone, a character without roots. It is also, also by nature a nomadic character, right? The first thing he does after he places his suitcase inside his new apartment is doesn't even open, unzip the suitcase, closes the door behind him, goes back to his car, goes back to the roads of Los Angeles. Because we know that being on the road with his preferred car, his favorite car, the Chevelle, is where he finds peace. At the end of the film, we see him on the road again, right? After the fight in the parking lot where, of the Chinese restaurant where he is stabbed and is seriously injured, stuck in his stomach. In turn, the driver kills Bernie Rose, gets into the car, and if we have time, we can review the frames for that scene, but it's very significant that you find him in the final frames, first sitting still, mortally wounded, you have to assume, given the nature of the, um, of, of the injury and, and the kind of uh, weapon, the uh, knife used by uh, Bernie Rose, who has a whole collection of knives, you find him sitting still. And you don't know, his eyes are open, but you may think as if you were, is that? 
right? That could be the end of the film. In fact, there are several variations that one can think of where you go from him being perfectly still with his eyes open, his body perfectly still, to a shot of his car on the road, which could be him dreaming of getting out of that situation, for example. No, you see, suddenly he's opening his eyes, starting the car, and getting on the road, which speaks to the theme of him as a superhero, right? Because only a superhero could survive that kind of wound and get on the road again, driving as if nothing had happened. So you find a character who in inhabits the space of the car, the intermediate space of the road, which is, we've seen with Itumama Tambien, an intermediate space between personal, private, and public. You find a character who's always on the move. Therefore, all these elements conspire into supporting a possible definition of this film as a world movie genre. It's not the only kind of exercise we can apply to this film, because we could also argue that this is essentially a Western movie, because it has a lot of the features and tropes that you find in classical Western movies, especially from the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s, where you find this lonely, strong, silent character, who's of course our hero, who's not a criminal, not a villain, but is not like the sheriff. He has his own idea of what justice entails, right? So he, in terms of morality and ethics, inhabit a fuzzy gray area between good and bad, but he's essentially a good guy you understand that spiritually or philosophically. And this kind of silent, lonely hero comes to town, right? The small Western town, in this case, comes to the building where Irene and Benicio are living. And through the rest of the film, he fights on the side of good against the villain, the villains, to save a woman and her son. A woman who, in a typical Western movie, would have been a widow because they didn't want to have any qualms with morality. In this kind of film, Irene is not a widow, but essentially she is not connected to standard, right? We know that they were married briefly before he went to prison. And in the book by James Salis Drive, the character of Irene tells the driver, literally, we were, we were married for 10 minutes, meaning it was a very short time before he went to prison. And of course, before he went to prison, she was pregnant with Benicio. And in the book, the character of Irene swears on God Almighty that she will not take that man back. And of course, as soon as, Benicio, as, soon as Stander leaves the prison, is back with her and with Benicio. But like in a good Western movie, the silent, strong guy fights the villain and sacrifices himself. You could say that he gives his life for Irene and Benicio's future and then disappears. For a brief moment during his sojourn, his residence in the western town, the hero plans, has dreams of a different kind of life, less nomadic, with roots, a kind of life where he could have a family with this woman and her son. But that dream, of course, is, is very brief because it is not in his destiny 
that he could enjoy that kind of life. Based on that, you can also understand the reference in the theme song, Real Human Being and Real Hero, to Mad Max, because the character of Mad Max, and again, Mad Max Fury Road will be our next film next week, the character of Mad Max in the entire series is the character of a lonely, strong guy who is traveling in this post-apocalyptic world and stopping only briefly in some places, developing brief temporary connections, doing things and almost losing his life to save other people and then just continuing on on his journey. Okay, so a lot of references to different genres and different films. Now, we can see the character of the driver as a character who has two sides or two faces that for a while in the film correspond to night and day, and then night and day in terms of activity get confused. There is no temporal circadian distinction between him portrayed as a superhero or some kind of hero or he portrayed as a human being. And of course, the first thing that poses him as a hero is the jacket. Actually, I should say the second one, because in the establishing shots, when you hear him talking on the, on the phone with the uh, mind or the boss of the criminals telling them, what the terms are of their deal and how the driver will only give them five minutes that will not be involved in the actual crime, etc., etc. Where do you find him? You find him at, the, at a very high floor in an apartment overlooking downtown Los Angeles at night. And you see him only through his reflection in the glass. So you find him perched above the city, overlooking the city, and that's a clear cliche for a superhero, right? Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, right? High above the city, trying to control the city in a position of control. From there, they can intervene, go down, and do, perform their hero deeds. So, First of all, you see him as a kind of superhero through his placement in the scene and his posture, overlooking the city. And there are a couple of other moments when you see the same thing. For example, before he, go, uh, he goes and try test the NASCAR car, race car uh, in front of Bernie Rose. And then the second thing you see about him that makes him a kind of hero. A superhero needs a uniform. His uniform is the jacket, the silver jacket with the scorpion. And throughout the film, once you see it, it's impossible not to see, not, not to ignore it. Throughout the film, he behaves differently when he's wearing the silver jacket with a scorpion or when he's just wearing his t-shirt or uh, the uniform uh, he wears at the auto shop, or uh, the, the blue shirt, or the jeans jacket, right? Whenever he's wearing all those civilian clothes, he's a human being. And usually that happens during the day at the beginning in the first half of the movie. When he's wearing the silver jacket with the scorpion, is the hero involved with criminals, but trying to control those criminals, right? He's not subservient to their whims, right? He's dictating the rules. And that's the significance of the Scorpion, right? You can interpret that in many ways, in the easiest 
lowest level interpretation would be that he's able to sting, right? And we know that the driver is able to deploy explosive violence. True, absolutely. But there is more to it. Because the uh, scorpion brings immediately to mind one of the classical ap classic apologues of, of Greek culture, which especially during the last 20 or 30 years has become very popular, and you find it in self-help books, you find it in novels, you find it in films. And that's the apologue, the short story with a lesson of the scorpion and the frog. If you're not familiar with it, of course, you can find it everywhere on the internet, but just to summarize it, you have a frog and a scorpion who need to cross the river. The scorpion tells the frog, take me on the other side. The frog says, no, because you will sting me and I will die. And the scorpion says, no, I cannot sting you because I don't know how to swim. And therefore, if I did so, I would die myself. So they start crossing the river, the, the frog is swimming, the scorpion is on the frog's back, and at some point the frog feels a pinch, feels the sting of the scorpion, and the frog says, why did you do it? Meaning, we're both about to die, and the scorpion says, because it's in my nature. And what does that mean? And, and the reference to the situation in the film is clear. It means you cannot have a secure deal with evil beings. You may think you can control evil people or establish rules that would protect the deal you're about to strike with them, but it's like striking a deal with the devil. <coughs> you will not see the other side. And it's significant, of course, that this would be also an apologue about going to the other side, crossing the river, right? Because that has a lot of significance for the character of the driver, who's always on the move, always transferring, and who's trying to get to the other side of life. The other side for him would be to be not just a superhero during the night and a mild, tame, domesticated human during the day, hiding his superhero side. His idea is to be a real person together with Irene and a real hero to Benicio, saving both of them, ensuring both of them have a future, the kind of peaceful future they deserve, okay? So that's the significance of the jacket. And in reference to the uh, superhero side of uh, that, you will find him wearing the silver jacket when, for example, he goes, of course, in the first scene, right? The chase where he shows his skills as a getaway driver. He's wearing that. You find him wearing the same jacket when he goes out from Irene's building after the chase is over. At the end of the chase, actually, when he's leaving the parking lot near the basketball arena in LA, you see him getting out of the silver jacket and just wearing a plain blue jacket. When he meets with Irene the first time, they cross paths. She's coming out of the elevator dressed as a waitress. He's going in, he's wearing that. But later on, when they meet again at the end of the night, he's, he's, he's feeling sleepy. She has a basket with laundry. The jacket is only on his shoulder, right? It's there, but he's not wearing it. And by the time he gets to the corridor, where both apartments have their doors, his apartment, Irene's apartment, you don't see the jacket anymore. He's, he's, 
you just see a, a plain uh, T-shirt, okay? But you see the silver jacket, again, when he is going to see Cook, the Albanian criminal who uh, uh, wants standard Blanche and the driver to hit this pawn shop, which in fact has a safe in the back with $1 million placed there by an East, East Coast mob, member of the East Coast Mafia. You see him wearing this jacket when he goes back to threaten Cook at his nightclub. You, he's wearing this silver jacket with a scorpion when he's going to kill Nino, and then later on when he's going to meet with uh, Benny Rose. And of course, when he's leaving at the end, when he miraculously recovers from this terrible stab wound and drives away, he's still wearing the silver jacket. So he's back to being this superhero and maybe he'll pretend to be human in some social situations, but he failed to become a real human being and a real hero. He saved Benicio and Irene, and why is Irene going back to his door at the very end? Because Irene took her distance from him after he killed the guy in the elevator in a very violent way, smashing his head with his foot. But then Irene goes back to his door at the very end and he's not there anymore because clearly he has left some money for her, right? And the, the shot, the last shot, which fades into the corridor and Irene going to, to uh, knock on his door is exactly a close-up of the open bag on the pavement of the parking lot full of money next to Bernie Rose's body, okay? So you, you have this intuition that she now is, is grateful to him and she wants to thank him or, or she wants to say, why did you do that? But he cannot find, she cannot find him. And during the day, as I said before, you see him at the supermarket, he's not wearing that silver jacket, right? When he meets with them. He's at the auto shop wearing a uniform, uh, for, for a mechanic. So during the day, he is a, a mechanic, a friendly neighbor, a potential stepfather to Benicio, and in all those roles, he never is never wearing the silver jacket that is reserved for his criminal activities or his fights against uh, criminals. And of course, you cannot forget about this the two-sided nature of this character, you cannot forget that he's a stunt driver, but also a stunt double, that term is also used. Uh, and therefore, that alludes to him playing different roles, pretending to be human when his true nature is that of nocturnal superhero and in fact, the only time you see him with this jacket is when, with Irene, is when after they've driven on the Los Angeles River, found this uh, incredible pond at sunset, then they go out again at night. And as I said, the first time that he is inviting her into his world. So he's wearing the silver jacket to show her who he really is, like Superman and Lois uh, Lane. It's like he's about to reveal his true nature to her by, number one, taking her on his usual night drives that are the only thing that give him peace and comfort, where he feels in harmony with the world. And also, number two, he is there to protect her, right? So that's his dream of becoming a real hero. I'll, I'll show you who I am and I will protect you. And this, of course, uh, doesn't go the way he uh, planned, 
Uh, okay, and this is very beginning of the film. Fading from black into his apartment overlooking downtown Los Angeles and all the details in here and all the talk that is done by the driver is to the effect that he is in control, that he gives instructions, precise instructions to the criminals. And of course, this works for him initially. It doesn't work as soon as he meets with Cook, right? Because with Cook, he will try to repeat the same script. I do this, I do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. And Cook looks at him with this kind of sardonic smile and then says, well, this is what I have in mind, this much for standard, all the while he's writing on his hand, this much for lunch and this much for you, and what he was writing on his hand was F off, right? So it's, it's not working. It's the frog and the scorpion. There is no deal that can be successful there. Okay, but initially, he's the superhero very much in control. You see that he is controlling the city, that he knows the city very well. And through all the symbols and the arrows and the plants, you know that he has a thousand different tricks that he can apply uh, to his mission, to complete his mission and, and successfully escape from the police, right? And from this shot, you... you move to him, and again you have him in this position that is typical of a certain kind of superhero who is watching over the city during the night and protecting someone, right? And then only after that you start seeing the scorpion and the silver jacket that are the equivalent of his superhero cape. And then you see this kind of anonymous place, but before you do, you see the TV with the basketball game because that's another trick that he has in mind in order to escape from the police to get, uh, uh, to, to merge with the people who are coming out of the basketball game. And then, of course, as I said, you see the suitcase because he's without root, he's just a nomad moving from place to place. And then you see him in his own car initially, right? Because that completes his superhero equipment. He has a uniform, a quasi cape that identifies him as a superhero. And he must have therefore also a special car, which is the Chevelle, and some kind of bat cave, right? Some kind of then, and, and that is, of course, the garage owned and operated by Shana, okay? And you see all these beautiful cars, but his choice is a car that is in itself double, because it has an, uh, uh, an exterior appearance, dull, boring car, and a hidden power, which is the power of the engine on this car and the power that is the result of the driving skills of the driver because driving is his super skill, right? When Irene will ask him, what do you do? He says, I drive, which is not in the book. The script went in many ways in a different direction, but the script is beautiful. I drive, meaning I'm the hero who drives. I'm that kind of hero. Every hero has a superpower. His superpower is driving. And then, of course, you see him back in this night scene with his uniform. And at the very end of this, and of course, you have a lot of shots of him in the car. at the end, this is at the end of the car chase, and you see him coming out of the car with his uniform, 
put it on the hat, and then, in, in just a few seconds, is out of his superhero cape and dressing normally like anyone else, right? You don't see him. Well, you, you, he's sporting his silver jacket, but you cannot see the scorpion anymore. You can barely see the silver, and it becomes just another anonymous member of the Los Angeles community, and he goes back to his place. And, and there, now he is wearing again the cape because, as I said, he's there to protect her, but he's also there to love her, right? Love her and Benicio. So you see him with his jacket initially, and she's wearing her uniform as a waitress. And he goes. Back to his apartment, then out again. But later on, you will see that jacket coming off for their second encounter. There it is. So he's wearing the jacket in a way that you can still see the scorpion, but he's not wearing it. It's just on his left shoulder. And there she is, right? They meet again, this reinforces their connection. She's looking at him, he's looking at her and smiling. Usually he's not smiling at night, he's only smiling during the day. But when they come out, see, the jacket is coming off completely in his hands and he's only wearing the t-shirt by the time they both enter the apartment looking at each other. Okay, let me see if I can show you one more thing. Here they meet again after the supermarket. He's wearing this kind of uniform, right? And this is his day personality, smiling, very humble, to the point where he says, you have to know this about me, my wheels are not in the car, I'm not uh, so well organized, right? But later on, you see him at the beginning of the night, overlooking the city, right? Looking down on Los Angeles because he's about to turn into a superhero, but he's also about to invite her into his world. And look, she's bringing him the jacket. That's the connection, the deeper connection, right? And, of course, they, as I said before, they will go out again together he takes the jacket from her he's ready to resume his role and there he is driving at night with his scorpion silver jacket and she is by his side and let me just show you briefly what I meant about the conclusion. So he's been stabbed, terrible wound. He's stabbed by Nino, by, sorry, by Benny Rose, who's like the scorpion, in a way, because, again, we know that Benny Rose wants him dead. However, Benny himself is taking an unnecessary risk 
by doing this in such close proximity. We know that Benny Rose likes to kill his victims in close proximity. For example, he does that with Shannon by taking Shannon's arm and then slashing it open with a razor, with a very sharp razor, so that he will bleed to death. But Benny himself is like the scorpion because he could have avoided that kind of proximity where he is also exposed to being hit by um, the driver. And, and this, in fact, happens. So Benny Rose is on the, on the pavement dying. And it seems like the driver himself is dying, right? And the sun is setting. And you see the amount of blood is being loosened. But he gets into the car. But again, it's not even he gets into the car. There is no movement other than the movement provided by the camera. The, the leg is not moving. The foot is not moving. The, the, the hand is not moving. And when you see his face, you may very well think that he is dead, right? That this is his end, that he sacrificed his life for Irene and Benicio to guarantee them a better and safer future. And then you have the superhero moment again, because all of a sudden, when because of the stillness and the seconds that go by every frame in here is one second, you're starting to think he is dead. And it lasts and lasts and lasts with the camera moving, but it's not moving. And then finally, look, I'm still clicking, so a lot of seconds, maybe 30 seconds altogether, he's moving his eyelids. Closing them and opening them again as if this were his resurrection. Or the moment when a superhero, whom you believe dead because he was still after the fight with a major villain, comes back to life because he's a superhero. And all of a sudden, after staying still, opens his eye, and, and he is perfectly in control, right? He resumes his activity, looks down, takes the hand off, and there he goes, right? So this makes him into a kind of superhero. And now notice how we go from a close shot of the money to Irene to suggest that Irene has received some of that money so that she'd be able to leave town and start a future. See? There it is. The transition, the fading, the money's there. Actually, I was wrong. I, I thought it was a close shot. Um, must have had some other film in mind uh, or some other frame in this. You see Benny Rose that. So you know that he's out of the picture, he cannot threaten, and Nino is that as well, cannot threaten Irene, and the money is all she needs to be safer. And again, that money will be left there, but from that money, he must have taken some money to give to her. And you see her going there to thank him, but he is not there. Now, I want to do two things. One is to show you, I want to show you two films that you may have not seen and that are related to uh, the scenes of the chases in uh, Drive from 2011. Uh, and, and first we go back to 1968 to a movie with Steve McQueen that was very successful where you find a very famous car chase of about 10 minutes with no dialogue at all. And what is different from car chases before this film and how this influenced a lot of films up to Drive, by, directed by Nicholas Fenton Refn, is first of all that you don't have any lines to make this more dramatic, more heroic, and second, Instead of focusing just on the cars, you have a lot of shots of the drivers. In this case, Steve McQueen, who's Frank Bullitt, a, a, a San Francisco detective who uh, is, is on a case involving a high-level mafioso, uh, Russo, who wants to collaborate with justice. And Russo is apparently dead, 
under police custody, but Bullitt has spread the rumor that he is still alive, and therefore there are other people following him on another car, a Dodge Charger. He will be driving a Mustang GT. Um, and uh, the other guys are trying to follow him to see whether he can reveal the location where this um, mafioso who's about to spill the beans is kept. Okay, so notice no dialogue, and besides the car, a lot of shots of the drivers from inside the car, which you find also clearly in life. 